Welcome to the program, Innovations in Negative Pressure Wound Therapy, Leveraging Evidence, Clinical Outcomes, and Novel Technology. This activity is supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare Medical Solutions Division. Our faculty for today are Dr. Luis Fernandez, who is the Professor of Surgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Tyler, Texas, Marianne Obst, a complex abdomen specialist out of Regions Hospital in St. Paul, and LJ Punch, a trauma surgeon and president of Power for STL in St. Louis, Missouri. Here are the faculty disclosures. The learning objectives for today are to analyze the evolution of negative pressure wound therapy and the evidence, examine innovations in negative pressure wound therapy, and explore cases and best practice use of closed incision negative pressure wound therapy, negative pressure wound therapy with installation, and hybrid, dra hybrid drapes in a variety of practice settings. My name is Luis Fernandez. I'm a trauma critical care surgeon, and I practice in Tyler, Texas. I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center. And I'll be talking to you about negative pressure wound therapy and some of the evidence that supports its use. Uh, Kim and his colleagues looked at a negative pressure wound therapy comprehensive review, and they looked at all of the evidence that was there. And they found uh, over 1,300 cases, of which 23 were randomized controlled trials. And they looked at different aspects of negative pressure dressing, negative pressure variations, and negative pressure with installation. And you can see here from the year 2000 to uh, currently 2015, as, as far as this chart is concerned, the evidence has been mounting significantly. So let's look at some of the early adoption of negative pressure wound therapy and some of the evidence that accompanies it. Prior to large randomized controlled trials that evaluated this technology, um, there really wasn't very much. And there was a need to review and utilize that existing data. So Gabriel and Kim and Camardo took a look at these things. And here's what they came up with. Uh, basically, what they did is they looked at weighted standardized mean differences. They looked at odd ratios. They looked at the authors used of Prisma, which is a preferred reporting items for systematic reviews, uh, and used the meta-analysis guidelines associated with that process. They looked at 13 studies, which comprised 720 patients. And they, these were all included in their analysis. And one of the things that they found in this chart, although it's a little bit busy, but the fundamental things to take away from this chart is that there were significantly fewer surgical debridements with negative pressure therapy and insulation debridement patients versus the control. And patients that use the, this type of technology, that particular group, the wounds were ready for closure faster than the control groups. And that's significant because these things have impl uh, implications not only in clinical improvement of the patient, but also the cost of care that's associated with that improvement. One of the other things that they looked at is, well, how do, how do we get there? Well, there's a reduction in bacterial count, which makes sense. It's, it kind of parallels wound healing. And they found that those on the negative pressure therapy group had 4.4 4. 4 times greater than the control group reduction in their bacterial count. Um, this was evident throughout all of the studies that were captured at the endpoint of this analysis. And they noticed that those in the negative pressure therapy group were 2.4 to 2.39 times more likely to close uh, than those in the control group. They also noticed that those patients who uh, undertook this mode of therapy, this negative pressure therapy, had shorter lengths of stay versus the control groups, 1.5 days versus 3.5 days. And that's a significant cost savings. So you get a similar outcome with lower cost savings. Well, how significant is it? A hospital day in the United States just on the wards about $2,000. A hospital day in the ICU is $6,000. A hospital day in the ICU on a ventilator is approximately $16,000. So anywhere that we can cut on that care and still get a good outcome or excellent outcome uh, is significant. So the conclusions that they came away from this is this, that those patients who underwent negative pressure therapy uh, treatment found that they had lower number of surgical debridements during therapy. Their time to readiness for final wound closure was, was uh, lower. The duration of therapy was actually more abbreviated. The number of wounds closed were more common in the negative pressure therapy group, as opposed to achieving that in the standard care group. And almost universally, 
those patients on the negative pressure group had reduced bacterial bio burden, which is makes sense because these patients who have reduced bacterial bio burden does not tax the, the, the individual patient. The body can then resolve the issues of bacterial contamination and proceed to healing in a much faster and more efficient uh, process. So let's look at close incision negative pressure wound therapy and some of the clinical advantages and some of the scientific evidence that's associated with it. This was actually introduced by Gomal and his group in 2006 as a post-operative attempt to provide a clean, dry wound environment in the immediate post-operative period, protect the wound from the environment and protect the environment from the wound. Basically what they used was a back therapy unit to provide continuous negative pressure and primarily close incisions in areas with high rates of wound complications. So typically obese patients in the groin region uh, after certain surgical procedures, colorectal procedures, vascular procedures, and so forth. Uh, Standard and his group uh, published a literature review of the, of the incisional uh, negative wound pressure therapy experience, as well as a bunch of case studies. And they described a very successful use of this technology over uh, multiple types of surgical incisions. These results then ultimately led to the development of the Provena incision management system. When we look at uh, this randomized controlled trial by Higuera, this is a very interesting trial. They looked at decreased 90-day surgical site complication rates with closed incision utilizing negative pressure therapy after they revised knee arthroplasties. And this was a randomized trial. They looked at approximately 440 patients. They did an interim analysis, which indicated termination of a clear benefit. So those patients that were receiving this therapy were, were doing so well that they had to actually terminate that component. A total of 242 patients completed the study and underwent follow-up. Approximately 124 of those 242 were treated with the closed incision system and negative pressure therapy. So in this study, what they noticed was that the subjects treated with closed incision negative pressure therapy were 78% less likely to experience any form of complication after 90 day, days compared to standard of care. When you excluded drainage, the 90 day uh, complication rate for lower and those treated with closed incision negative pressure uh, therapy group, 2.4% versus 10.9% of the standard of care. They also looked at the differences between patients who were classified as septic and aseptic. Even in the septic patient group, the closed incision negative pressure therapy group had a much lower um, complication rate, 13% versus the standard of care at 19.4%. And in the aseptic group, approximately 2% versus 15.5%. One of the things that was uh, outstanding in this uh, study was that those with the closed incision negative pressure group exhibited significantly lower day, 90 day readmission rates and also had shorter length of stay if readmitted. They looked, also looked at, in this study, which I find very interesting, they also looked at so what happens to these patients after we've done all these things? How did they do in their daily living? How did they proceed in sports and recreation and pain and so forth? And they noted that those patients in the closed incision negative pressure therapy group did much better, significantly better than those in the standard of care group as, as illustrated here. So in summary, this study looked at uh, the efficacy of closed incision negative pressure therapy versus silver impregnated standard of care dressing and mitigating 90-day um, complication rates in wounds. And as we've reviewed here, all those patients that were treated with closed incision negative pressure therapy did significantly better than those patients treated with the standard of care in this particular study. So this study is very well done, it's comprehensive, and it seems to suggest that all of these patients do much better when they're treated with closed incision negative pressure therapy, even those that have sepsis as part of their diagnosis, although that's not recommended in, uh, in the use of this uh, technology, but even in those patients, they did better. So again, the conclusions here to summarize, the subjects were treated uh, with negative pressure therapy, 78% less likely to experience complications. Their readmission rates were lower. Uh, for those patients uh, that were readmitted, their length of stay was lower. And so their reoperation rates also was lower on those patients that were treated with closed incision negative pressure therapy. 
So here's some cases. This is a 65 year old gentleman. He had multiple recurrent ventral hernia repairs, had a weight reduction operative intervention, underwent adhesive lysis, myocutaneous flap advancement, and partial component separation, as you can see here. We did an anterior dissection to the mid axillary line, we placed a retrorectus uh, stratus placement, and then we closed the native fascia uh, over the initial uh, repair. This is what the skin looked like. At the time, we didn't have the customizable uh, Provena. We were one of the earlier uh, users in, um, in the Southwest. And so we placed the Provena peel in place on this gentleman. As you can see here, his outcome is superb. Uh, he's got an excellent uh, cosme cosmetic result. The, the hernia repair from a biomechanical standpoint is a success. And this patient was very happy at six months. So let's look at some of the draping systems that there's been a lot of uh, concern about the polyvinyl dress, uh, dressing systems that we have now. So they were doing some research on trying to improve that process. Some of the issues that we have is that you can't reposition it. Uh, sometimes some patients, particularly those elderly patients uh, who have uh, frail skin, they, they uh, experience some pain in the removal of the dressing. It was also cost related to the waste. Uh, seal in complicated areas was difficult. The, the polyvinyl would stick to gloves. Um, and also the time to train people how to use a polyvinyl um, uh, appropriately was also a concern. So this product came out. This was a uh, hybrid drape for negative pressure wound therapy. It's the first silicone and acrylic drape that provides a balance uh, for wound healing and support. And this is what it looks like. And when you look at this, the acrylic is actually inside the circles and the silicone is outside the circles. And what the acrylic does, it ensures a tight seal while the silicone allows for repositioning and also easy handling during dressing changes. It's also very gentle on the skin envelope. And here's some uh, data that we obtained from customer preference testing. They looked at 17 patients, underwent 53 applications. This is by Galarza. Uh, they achieved a 100% seal at every application. 100% of the patients said no pain or removal and no, none observed skin irritation. So some of the feedback from the CPT uh, is listed here for you. Uh, some of the uh, issues on the drape applications, don't stretch it, leave at least five centimeter border and apply loosely over the wound area. And you can cut some slits and curved areas and overlap the fold, uh, the fold to remove any wrinkles. So these are some different uh, uh, wound types that we looked at at a uh, limited commercial release. Again, the feedback was quite uh, outstanding. Um, when we look at the, compared to the current drape versus the HA drape, um, there's a single clear release liner, no need to, for window painting. There's no need to use skin prep products and less, uh, less cutting. So here's some uh, cases here. Uh, again, these are complex wounds. As you can see, we were able to address these issues and obtain a seal. As we gained more experience uh, with these cases, uh, we were able to use less and less product. And on this particular case, on hospital day five, the patient uh, was discharged home and it followed the cl clinic. The wound was 90% closed. Here's another case. Again, a complex superficial interior abdominal wall abscess and a vesicle cutaneous fistula. We were able to control that and apply the HA drape. The patient went home without any complications. We were able to publish uh, our results. Um, and uh, as you can see here, and also presented these as a uh, poster at SAWC. Uh, this poster actually came out uh, recently at the 2021 uh, Wound Healing Society SAWC virtual as well. So let's look at back airflow cleanse choice dressing. Um, the proposed mechanism of action is it softens, it separates, and solubilizes. And the dressing during the dwell phase, uh, as you can see here, the illustration that, that it describes the different phases, uh, how this works. When we initially uh, were the first to trial this, uh, we developed this algorithm, as you can see here. We thought initially the stage two and stage three would be the most appropriate patients. However, after gaining experience with this particular modality. Uh, we also started using stage four, and now we find that those stage two and up, uh, the vast majority are amenable to this type of therapy. 
Uh, this is a summary of some of the patients that we looked at in our uh, initial article that we published in 2017. As you can see, it's a quite varied uh, case series. Uh, this is a 59-year-old female that presented with uh, paniculitis and a grade three panicular ulcer. Had, you can see here 80% of the, of the ulcer was devitalized tissue and not a candidate for surgical debridement because the patient was in incredibly poor shape. So this is how we initially applied the contact layer and then uh, covered it. And this is what it looked like on day six, less non-viable tissue. And on day nine, we had 90% viable granulation, granulation tissue at the wound base. And we discontinued therapy and converted to standard negative pressure therapy. And this other case, this is, uh, we used, uh, in all of these cases, we used insulation hypochlorous acid. But in this particular case, uh, you can see the changes uh, on day zero versus day three. Uh, and how did we get there? When you look at day six, we always score these SHARs. So day six, there's, we did minimal bed, uh, uh, bedside debridement on these types of SHARs. And that's how we are allowed uh, to get an excellent uh, outcome. So in this case, uh, we used uh, pure hypochlorous acid to, uh, as, an inst uh, as our preferred insulin solution with a dwell time of 10 minutes and Q2 hours. Uh, we set it at negative 125 millimeters of negative pressure, and we changed the dressing every 48 to 72 hours. And you can see here the progression of uh, improvement. We score the SR, allows the hypochlorous acid, which has some um, protonations, uh, weak protonations uh, bond disruption properties, and it gets under that SR and actually allows it to clean it very well. This is another case of an elderly gentleman who was had prior stroke. We applied the uh, uh, negative pressure uh, back lens choice here, and he removed it within 24 hours. And in 24 hours, we were able to get an excellent debridement. So one of the things that we learned with negative pressure therapy with insulation debridement is that it has certain unique properties. It provides excellent medical debridement. It can be applied safely to debilitated patients. And can decrease co cost of care by more effective beds, bedside debridement and decreasing the need for debridement in the operating room in many cases, uh, as illustrated in our experience. So we published that here and presented at SAWC as well. So here's another case. This is an interesting case of salvage of uh, an infected acetabular repair. So this patient had multiple um, traumatic injuries, as you can see here, most of them were life-threatening she had a very high uh, probability of non-survival. She developed multiple complications, ARDS, hyperbilirubinemia, pulmonary embolism, hemorrhagic gastritis, uh, bacterial colonization, and infections as well. She was taken to the OR for emergent uh, chlorotial laparotomy, underwent these procedures that are listed here, and 24 hours later was returned to the operating room for bile and estenosis and primary abdominal closure. Six days after that, she was taken uh, uh, excuse me, within 24 hours of that procedure, she went to the operating room to, for uh, ORIF of her skeletal injuries, including a left acetabular um, injury. Six days later, she returned to the, uh, to the OR with uh, the orthopedic surgeons who thought they were dealing with a hematoma and turned out to be a massive fecal contamination due to uh, venous ischemia of the signal coma. The yeah, patient underwent uh, appropriate laparoscopic procedures, underwent a uh, colostomy, as you can see here, she uh, uh, had certain cultures which obtained uh, ESLA and CRE bacteria infection and was placed in appropriate antibiotics. This is what the wound looked like after uh, initial debridement uh, and therapy with uh, uh, negative pressure wound therapy with installation and debridement is approximately uh, two weeks. And as you can see here, we applied um, uh, a synthetic ECM we used a technique that uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Villarreal and I um, developed. And because we were dealing on one side with the retroperineum, and the other side, we had to have a contact layer to the exposed hardware and infected bone. So what we did here is we folded the contact layer of the negative pressure therapy of the back lens choice, and we applied a, uh, uh, a barrier as you can see here. And then we simply folded it over, stapled it on, and then whatever was in excess, uh, uh, we removed it. 
Um, excuse me. So here's how it, uh, it looked uh, on the left hip dressing and uh, exposed contaminated hardware. You can see granulation tissue developing there, uh, replacing the ECM into the wound. Again, our technique shown here. And I'm pointing to on that last uh, image on the right to the contact layer that we uh, uh, opposed against the hardware and the bone. We also did a closure of the abdominal wall. We used a uh, closed incision negative pressure adaptation here, which is, excuse me, application there. And also, uh, this is what it looked like when we placed the negative pressure back lens choice dressing with Dermatac as well. This is what the initial CT looked like uh, with IV contrast. You can see a significant amount of fluid and inflammatory material. And this is what it looked like at day 42. Uh, almost all of it was removed. The patient, uh, this was the patient's current wound appearance. She was a febrile, no permanent discharge, had a small eight centimeter tunnel, white cell count was normal, um, no evidence of active infection. Uh, our next steps were to continue with present therapy until the wound fully granulated. Um, uh, however, she did develop a, a, a vascular necrosis of the femoral head she underwent resection of the femoral head with placement of weight-bearing spacer and reconstruction and revision of the acetabulum. The interesting thing about that surgery, which I uh, had an extensive conversation with the orthopedic surgeon, there was no clinical evidence of infection or contamination. The patient is now participating in ambulatory and physical therapy, which is a tremendous outcome because the alternative was that if we were not able to control and try to salvage that repair, she would have ended up with a hemipelvectomy and a left lower extremity amputation. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to present for you, and I hope that you found uh, these cases interesting and informative. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fernandez. That was an amazing lecture. As always, you cover so much information, and it's such valuable information for everybody that's working in this field. <clears throat> My name is Marianne Obst, and I am the Complex Abdomen Specialist at Regents Hospital which is the Level 1 Trauma Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. And today I'm going to talk about cases and best practice with the use of multiple different kinds of negative pressure system and drapes. So my first case is a closed incision management case. And I think that um, every closed incision management patient has a big story to tell before they have got to that point. And just like Dr. Fernandez's lecture, you can see that his patients went through so much before they ended up um, with that final beautiful closure. And so this patient is no different. He came to us from about eight hours away um, for a consult for a complex abdominal reconstruction. And so as he came in, he had just a bandage on his, on his abdomen. We knew ahead of time because we had reviewed his CT scans that he had a small bowel fistula with kind of a long sinus tract. And so we knew it was gonna be a big surgery. And so anything we can do to make sure that we're successful in the surgery we do. So we have a, an app on our phones, it's for free and you can check it out. Um, it's called the CDAR app and it really is about seven questions that you can flip through with your patient to show them their risk, um, the potential for risk after this type of a surgery. And so we did that with this nice gentleman. He had 87% risk and his modifiable risk factors really were weight loss. And so he, we sent him back home in October to lose some weight, um, do a little bit more conditioning before we do the surgery. So we brought him back um, the day before surgery actually and had him stay overnight. I took off his fistula manager and I popped him into the shower. I'm like, you know, this is a big day. You're getting your last pouch, you know, before you won't have a fistula anymore. And, and these folks, you know, they've been dealing with these things for months and months and months. And, and so this is a, it's kind of a big monumental day. And so he calls me and he says, there's something sticking out of me. So I, I gave it a tug. I thought it was a piece of ham. And um, it turns out that it was actually his infected mesh. And so as you can imagine, the whole surgical team was a little on edge that night because he was the first case the next morning. So we did our surgery, took down soft tissue. You can see we took out a bunch of infected mesh, obviously his piece of ham, and he did lose a little bit of small bowel. 
We did bilateral external oblique releases and also did um, recto rectus mesh placement. I like to help close these patients because I have them group the staples in groups of um, like five staples with a gap of three to four centimeters between. And the reason I do this is because we use the French fry technique where we place white foam wicks all the way down to the fascial layer, which decreases our seromas. We actually clear drape the entire skin around the incision, except for not the excision. And then we put what's called a big bolster vac on. And this vac will do a couple things. Decreases pain because they're very supported in this vac and they're able to really cough hard and get around without using an abdominal binder. And so that's really super helpful. And if your drain gets too close to your vac, like they do sometimes, if you just use a hydrocolloid ring and cover it with clear drape, you'll be good to go. So on seven days later, we take down, or three, um, excuse me, three days later, we take down that back, take out the white foam wicks, place them in a customizable incision management system. And then seven days later, we took that down because he was going to head home. And you can see his incision is just beautifully um, healed. I just put an island dressing over the top of it just so his clothes didn't touch it and he went home. So let's talk about these closed incision management systems. So if you have a patient that has a curve or a turn in it, you really shouldn't use the peel in place method. So the peel in place are awesome. They're super easy to use. And they're exactly what you hear, what their name is. You peel the backing off and you place it over the incision and it's just that easy. But if you have a little bit of a jog or a turn, you definitely want to try a different system like the um, customizable. So this patient, you can see, I switched her out of this um, kind of bent peel in place into a customizable, which really helped a lot. And so how do we do this step by step? We cut the foam so that the hydrocolloid is, a, is away. And then you put the foam so it's touching one another. You're going to add hydrocolloid to the area where the foam ends and there's no hydrocolloid in place. And then on this bottom part, you have the hydrocolloid that runs up and down each side. And then you're going to take an extra piece, put it over the bottom so that you complete that track and then you'll get the best seal. And you can see from this next patient that you can be super creative and have um, incisions in different areas that you can cover because that white contact layer on the backside can go directly on the skin. So let's switch to incision management. This gentleman came in um, on May 11th and we were unsure of exactly how to treat him. So we did installation up and over his S car, as you can see. The dressing looks like this completed because we're actually putting the installation port of the installation vac on the wound itself because it is a posterior wound. And then we're running the tubing up the bridging and then the negative pressure port is up here on the top of the bridge. I like to offload pressure by using silicone border dressings. And in a couple of days, you can see that he's starting to lift this Escar up. The, the tissue underneath really looked beautiful, and we were able to just do bedside sharp debridement. By the 20th, we've really made some um, headway, again, using just little pieces of sharp debridement to get off that Escar, not needing to take this patient back to the operating room as he had a BMI of 70, so it was really risky for him. And by the 24th of May, this is what we generally see. About the third dressing change, you really see a remarkable change when you're using the installation um, vac. By June 8th, they really felt he was ready for skin grafting. They put a skin graft on a Friday and unfortunately his vac did not hold over the weekend and they lost most of the skin graft. But even when that happens and you're so disappointed because your skin graft didn't hold, it's amazing that the structure and the cells from the skin graft actually are there. And you can see within just a couple of days, he's really here remarkably, despite the fact that he lost that graft. So this little gal, um, her biggest problem was pain. And so she, she doesn't have a huge remarkable wound. She had a seroma that we needed to release, um, but we really wanted to clean her up with the installation vac, but she just couldn't handle the um, pain with taking the drape off or really just touching her at all made her really uncomfortable. So what we did was um, we used the installation vac and you can see we're, we're kind of molding that foam into the wound underneath that kind of undermining. And, and then we're actually adding big you know, pieces of this hybrid drape that has silicone in it. And it's much more comfortable for her. 
<clears throat> and then the installation port, I'm putting it at the highest level. So gravity helps the fluid come down. And then I like to give the ports a lot of like love. You know, I just kind of run my finger around the edges just to make sure I have a really nice seal with these patients. And just in one dressing change, you can see how much her wound healed. She needed no extra narcotics getting the dressing off this day and she actually helped us to peel it off. And so that's a huge thing to offer a patient that is uh, pain adverse and you're really trying to decrease your narcotic use. And here she is in clinic in October. She's just a very sweet gal. So we know the mechanism of action of standard vac with the macro and micro strain. What's kind of new to us is the installation side of this. So you can instill solutions that can help to break down the debris, break down anything that's in your wound bed so it can soften and be removed. So the game changer is this new gray foam and it comes with three pieces, which I think has been confusing to a lot of people. The contact layer is the one that you definitely wanna have against the wound bed. The thin layer and the thick layer, you have to use your judgment to use. I love the thin layer for bridging, but I like to always land my um, negative pressure track pad on the thick layer. So even if I bridge, I'll use a piece of the thick layer at the top of the bridge, or if I'm going directly over the wound, I wanna make sure I'm landing on that thick cover layer. So how it works, I like to start my, my dressings out in the negative pressure phase and then do the installation and soak time. And this is an automatic thing that the pump will do for you. So you kind of set your preference and everyone will have their own um, preferences. And so I say, kind of read through the literature and figure out what works for your facility. So this is what I do on Sunday afternoons. I videotape the backside of dressings, but I really wanted to show how the fluid goes directly through the foam. It's not really like a sponge. It's going through the foam to interface with the wound bed and the foam itself so that when the negative pressure is deployed, the, that vacuum can take the debris and bring it into the foam and get rid of it off of the wound face. So there's different types of foams. So we all know the black foam, that's the standard vac foam. And in our facility, we always use this to bolster skin grafts over biologics, that kind of thing. The white foam is, an, is also a very um, foam that everyone's very comfortable with. We like to use it over vessels or things that we're trying to protect. Then there's definitely specialty foams. We use a lot like in burn care and then there's installation foams that are also black, but you can instill through them because you cannot instill through the standard black foam because the standard black foam will take up the fluid. And then there's the new game changer gray foam, which we really love at our facility. And then there's times that you need a foam um, or a dressing that goes inside of the abdomen for an open abdomen. And that's the, this, the blue foam, as you can see here, it's got a protection layer for the bowel. And then the purple ones are the ones that are made for closed incisions. So sometimes it's hard to decide which foam to use for which. So we have kind of a decision-making tree that we use um, at our facility. So the supplies needed to start installation is the installation cassette. So I never even knew anything went on the other side of the Alta pump, but um, there is a little area where you click it in and obviously a canister, you have to decide on what solution you want and what kind of dressings. So the equipment capabilities of this particular pump is amazing. You can have fill volumes kind of all over, soak times as short as one second, installations every three minutes. It comes as it turns on, the factory settings are a 10 minute soak, every three and a half hour is at a negative 125. And this is the settings that is based in clinical research. We sometimes will also do a five minute soak every two hours and you'll see that through this presentation. Sometimes we decide on that mostly because of the fact that the patients either it's a posterior wound or the patient's walking on the wound or there's somewhere where the long soak time might um, lose your seal because it is not a negative pressure during the time of the soak phase. We made an order set to make this easier for everyone kind of pulling out all the different pieces of this. And then fill volumes is always kind of a fun time. We all stand around and kind of decide what, you know, how much we really need. There is mathematical equations. You can use the fill assist function. And in our facility, we're pretty much, because we've done enough of this, we're just doing it by clinical experience. 
The software in the pump is super helpful. And when we first started instilling, we definitely had a lot of new uh, alarms. And so I was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to handle this? Well, the funny thing is, is that if you touch the question mark on the bottom left-hand side of the actual alarm that's on the pump, it will tell you on the next page what the problem is and how to troubleshoot it. So we kind of started a program where we just, if, if there was a problem with the blockage, touch the question mark, read the, the helpful hints that the software is giving you and see if you can figure out the problem. And this was just like a little gift that we got, you know, I mean, canister evaluation was not something that they talked about when we first doing this installation negative pressure system. And so, but it's become real fun. Like the, uh, the teams at the bedside are like, you know, if you have a, a vac that looks like this, you're definitely cleaning a lot of stuff up, but maybe you want to cycle it more often. And I love that everyone's starting to put input into that. So in installation, because it does take a little extra equipment and a little bit more time and patience, over the past four years, we've placed 7,060 negative pressure dressings at our facility. And you can see that our installation um, percentage started at 12% in 2017, which was kind of our first big year, and then up to 20% in 2020. Now, the beginning of 2021 to our first quarter, we're looking at about 40%. So, you know, it's kind of, the outcomes are totally worth it, but you definitely need to be patient and you know put together programs that really help your clinicians to work with this new technology. So abdominal wounds with an ostomy are always a challenge, and I just wanted to touch on them quick because you might want to be you might be nervous about doing installation with that. And so my my tip to you is always do the vac first. It's going to give you a stable abdominal wound, and sometimes because the the abdomen is you know, a tube, if you have an abdominal wound, you kind of crack the egg and then the stoma pulls back a little bit. But when you use a vac and you can kind of bring those edges together, a lot of times the stoma will come forward and then it's a lot easier to get a pouching system on. I like to have a bridge between, and sometimes it has to be kind of a skinny bridge because these things can get close to one another um, <clears throat> and then get your vac on and put your pouching system on top of that. So we're gonna do two necrotizing soft tissue injury cases. This is a gentleman that came in um, after a fall and then he ended up with necrotizing soft tissue. And you can see we're doing wide incisions. And sometimes when I come into a case like this, you know, I have that moment of, oh my goodness, I, I just don't even know where to start. But my tips to you are start at a superior edge, like never start at the bottom because the dripping from the wound during your case will end up, you know, taking off your edging. And, and so I always say, start at the top of the mountain, work towards the bottom um, and just get stuff done. Like sometimes I'll just start with this easy part, you know, right here in the opening so that it's just, so I can feel like I'm really making progress. And sometimes in these cases, like this gentleman, I mean, we had to resuscitate him most multiple times because, you know, they're acutely ill. These are critically ill patients. It's like a 38 to 48% mortality for necrotizing soft tissue injury. And so you can see here his, little um, skin edges. I mean, his wound is doing fine, but his little skin edges are all beat up because he was swelling with fluid resuscitation and then shrinking and the acrylic drape really wasn't, it, it doesn't give as much. And so these are the folks that even though they're a really big wound, I'll add that acrylic or the hybrid drape because it has a lot more flex to it. So it doesn't cause those skin injuries. And so I still use the barrier ring and I, I drape across from you know the outer edge over here all the way across and hang it into the wound. It is much less painful coming off and it really helps to protect that skin wound junction. And if you have a big crease like this, sometimes they'll even layer it up a little bit. It really does a nice job. So this same gentleman by May 12th, we got him into the operating room for skin grafting. So we started him prone and you can see this is his donor site over here. We're grafting his back. And we also did his, um, his front in different levels of graft, some tighter meshed and some wider mesh. We also use a, a, like a cell spray. You can see they're spraying it over the top of the graft as well. He actually walked out of the hospital not very long ago. So that was really amazing to me that these folks can go through all this and then still walk out. You know, it's just, it's just an amazing feeling. So here's another kid. He had a bug bite and ended up with necrotizing and soft tissue, came to us from outside state, had, I don't know, 13 surgeries before this case itself. And you can see it's kind of the side of his wound and all the way down. And I think, again, you know, just start somewhere. And so um, I start at the top and kind of work my way down. I try to 
put installation ports where gravity will help me. So every installation needs another pump. So don't be afraid to order another pump on these bigger cases. And kind of my rule of thumb is if I have um, every third dressing that I open, I call for another pump because I just feel like that's enough surface area that you have to have another dress or have another pump. And then you can see you can always Y in more negative pressures um, track pads. And I try to use the installation kind of as the pitcher's mound and then the negative pressures as the bases to keep them together so that I group my pumps in sections. And you can see we're not putting a ton of fluid in here. I mean, it was only 200 cc's total. We did a five minute soak every two hours at 150. And in one dressing change, we've really done a lot of work. You can see his tissue has really come a long ways in that it was um, non-bloody. You know, his peri wound skin looks a lot better. I, I think that this technology is, it's a huge game changer. It's not all that easy to use sometimes, but it's definitely worth it. So interesting on this case right here, I, I must've ran out of waffle foam or, um, something happened that I didn't put any there. And look at the difference in quality of the, um, of the cleanup that was done from this area where, they had the, where I had the waffle phone down to this one area that I didn't. So I think that's super interesting to show that that, that weird uh, waffle foam really makes a huge difference and you have to really get it into all those little nooks and crannies to clean things up. Um, the last thing people ask a lot is, can you use multiple pumps on one big wound? And the answer is yes. Obviously, we have four stacked here. They have some kind of internal program that they know uh, when the other one's going off, so you don't need to have them in synchrony. They do a nice job working together. And this gentleman, much like the last one, bless his soul, he um, left our facility on April 12th and was discharged to home. We haven't actually seen him back since, so um, I'm sure he's doing very well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, for your amazing lectures. I always love listening to you and I will, um, I will wrap it up there. Thanks, Marianne. And, and thank you, Dr. Fernandez, for letting me join on this conversation. I'm really excited to share with you these next three cases from the perspective of a trauma surgeon who's been grappling with soft tissue injury and infection for a while. Um, I'm Dr. LJ Poncha. Again, I'm a trauma surgeon. I'm based out of St. Louis right now. And I am currently the executive director of a nonprofit uh, that's working to reduce the, in, the impact of trauma in the St. Louis region. I also do critical care at a local hospital and a lot of COVID work. And I have a long history in doing extensive soft tissue surgery for people uh, with serious invasive infection and trauma. These three cases I'm getting ready to share, I think are gonna really help sort of put some meat on the bones of what you just heard about the uses for negative pressure therapy and the unique ways in which they can allow us to resuscitate tissue. All right, so the first case is a case of a woman with rheumatoid arthritis, 55 years old, who presented to the hospital with really bad perforated diverticulitis and a pelvic abscess. We managed her non-operatively for a few days, but she was unable to resolve her sepsis without surgical intervention and ended up needing to go to the operation, operating room for a sigmoidectomy with ostomy perforation. Now the patient again had rheumatoid arthritis and had been on immunosuppressant medication that was really literally life-giving. Before this, she had been wheelchair bound for 10 years and it was really important for her to be on those rheumatoid arthritis meds so that she could have her freedom and mobility and so she very soon after surgery resumed her rheumatoid arthritis meds, uh, her two immunosuppressants, which really had a profound impact on her uh, healing. While she did okay in terms of her surgical uh, midline wound, the rheumatoid arthritis meds caused her to have complete mucocutaneous disruption of her ostomy. Let me show you what that looked like. So here is her uh, midline incision ended up healing just fine, but she separated her skin around from the ostomy. And then because she had prior weight loss surgery and had a small panis, the weight of that pulled the entire abdominal wall down over the ostomy such that it became completely covered with skin and she was uh, experiencing a functional large bowel obstruction from it. So she needed two operations, right? So she needed a paniculectomy to get that weight of the abdominal wall off of that skin, but she also needed an ostomy revision because at this point, the skin was starting to get stuck in this position and really needed to be formally 
revise. So this is mixing business and pressure, pleasure, right? We don't do paniculectomies and ostomy revisions in the same uh, setting. You have a profound burden of bacteria, of skin around the ostomy site. You're gonna be leaking stool. There's gonna be all things happening, but then you need this sort of pristine, clean, really nice area for this large incision. Again, in somebody who at baseline is immunocompromised. So let's see what we did in the operating room. We performed the paniculectomy uh, and then with the ostomy completely occluded and covered up, cleaned everything really well and put down a Provena. Uh, you can see here, this is the customizable. So it was made to fit the length that was perfect for her panis incision. And then reprepped, got to the ostomy, revised it and sutured it. And you know, every fresh ostomy is gonna leak a little bit, right? Like it's like in the, in the post-op, in the recovery room, if, if it's productive, it's going to leak some, but thank goodness we had that Provena in place, left it on for about seven days. She came back to clinic. And here you can see the incision where the Provena was pristine and clear and the ostomy uh, now continent with a bag on it and her not having any obstructive symptoms incision went on to heal perfectly and she then had ostomy revision about six months later. So really, really an example of the ways in which we can really resuscitate and protect an incision, even in almost something that's like a war zone. I mean, ostomy juice, that's gross, but she really, really did well. And that's an example of what Provena can do for our incisions, keeping them clean, proximating the edges, promoting edema to be uh, removed from the wound and making sure that we have a low, low, low chance of having any seroma or infection. That's a great example right there. Um, here she is now, again, those pictures of the ostomy, really healthy, and then her final uh, reversal and, and midline incision that healed extremely well after it was once again treated with Provena. You can see the marks there of uh, the incision. So really, really great example. Uh, how about diabetic foot infections? This was a gentleman, 56, who presented to the hospital with foot pain. It was a terrible story. So he was a prior uh, a part of the law enforcement who was retired and was working at a hospital to be a security guard. And he was doing drills where for some reason they had him kicking down doors, but he didn't have any you know, steel-toed boots, no safety shoes. He felt the pop. Um, went to a primary care doctor a week later with redness and swelling, got started on Keflex, came back, same problem, got started on clindamycin. Three weeks into it, he presents to us with gas all through the posterior uh, components. Um, all his whole plantar fascia was just gone, devastating soft tissue infection with an MSSA bacteremia as well. So went to the operating room, there was really no way to save this foot due to the extensive tissue loss that he had. Turned out he had a few broken uh, metatarsals and a devastating osteo as well. And um, the extent of the staph infection created a necrotizing fasciitis all along his posterior deep and some of the anterior compartments so that up to his knee, he had fasciitis. So basically um, we had a wound in which there needed to be a resolution of cellulitis, fasciitis, muscle preservation, and really, really getting cleaned up as aggressively as possible from a staph RAS infection and someone who didn't have the ability to lose any more tissue before he was looking at, instead of a below knee amputation, an above knee amputation. So took it to the operating room and put on the uh, um, Veriflow system. So this system uh, was applied into and extending up to all those fascial components. I uh, had a counter incision laterally to allow a deeper aspect to the anterior compartment and, and basically had foam all into those spaces, was treated with uh, insulation, just with normal saline every three and a half hours for 10 minutes, and then uh, was taken to a uh, recovery room and then to the uh, ICU because he was critically ill. And then he had a massive end STEMI, big heart attack, and uh, was uh, didn't have to go to the cath lab, but basically needed to uh, be treated aggressively, including heparinization. And we were able to get him through that period of time after surgery without touching his wound, without causing it to bleed, without doing bedside dressing changes, um, and eventually stabilized him and explained to the cardiologist, we were able to take him back to the operating room under um, 
uh, a nerve block instead of general anesthesia to re completely revise and close his blown knee amputation. On day five, you see we were able to preserve tissue. And then this is what he looked like three weeks out. Now that's not totally perfect, but the point is that two operations, uh, use of Veriflow therapy, getting him through many adverse ev events, including a bacteremia and a STEMI, he ends up with a closed baloney amputation stump that has no dehiscence um, and even was able to save a baloney amputation in the setting of fasciitis. It's really interesting to see the ways in which this therapy allowed us to, again, resuscitate the tissue and get control of the infection uh, while the patient is sort of getting care otherwise. Um, I think the, th the key thing here is host factors, like things that are in someone's baseline physiology that really are an obstacle to wound healing the, these two therapies really bring together nicely. And so now um, I'm gonna show you a patient who represents to me one of the most difficult cases in terms of uh, how bad necrotizing infection and deep, deep, deep space infection could get, but how limited someone's physiology could be. This is a 42 year old woman who had a sacral pressure injury after three weeks of hospitalization uh, and ventilation, um, who presented uh, as a transfer from another hospital with this wound while she was getting resuscitated or getting sort of rehabilitated from her pulmonary status and 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 also was a Jehovah's Witness with a hemoglobin of 6.5. She had a 20 by 7 by 15 centimeter deep injury that went all the way down to the bone at stage four and required the excisional debridement for extensive slough and necrotic tissue. She was also ambulatory and totally sunset, so was not really able to tolerate bedside dressing changes. And I had clarified that she was not willing to take a blood transfusion. Now, you know, sacral injuries that go all the way down to the bone, any bony debridement can be associated with a lot, a lot of blood loss, right? And so uh, we basically are like, I have to get this clean. Uh, I have to do it in a way that she can basically get trips to the operating room that are not excessive because she can't tolerate the stress and change at the bedside. I need to do this in a way that is gonna promote healing uh, as much as possible and, 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 and do it in a way that we, she can eventually stop going to the operating room because this is just so extensive. So I used the reticulated, the, 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 the open uh, cleanse choice macroporous foam as the contact layer on this wound after doing minimal surgical debridement and changed it on day three and day seven. Um, the, uh, I used just staling for lavage at 3.5 hours for 10 minutes and then actually did something I had never done before, which is I primarily closed a pressure injury. So this is what it looked like in the operating room before we did the, de the debridement and the application. Here I am now really making sure that that, that foam that macroporous foam is getting in contact with the entire contour of the wound, then filling in the inner area with foam to keep it sort of pressed out to the edges and then applying a bridge, which I make very wide and very thick if I'm going to be using installation because I think this is really, really important to make sure you, it's a two-way street and you wanna get that movement of the solubilized material out of the foam and also get make sure you're getting the fluid in. Um, and then here's what she looked like on day 10. Again, as I'm pulling out that foam, you can see the magic that it's doing. I'm telling you, that's not surgical debridement. That is 10 days of insulation therapy with that uh, foam. And then uh, was basically, again, able to primarily close and then had a, a component of incisional negative pressure therapy that I customized to the wound. And here's what she looked like um, at, at uh, week six. So the primary closure did beautifully. Here, the wound is only five centimeters deep, five centimeters deep, it was 10 centimeters deep. She was able to tolerate just some wicking packing and then was able to close completely. So uh, an amazing example of using this to get non-viable tissue out of the wound with the reticulated foam, the macroporous foam, uh, adding to the power of the installation therapy to really, really resuscitate this tissue and get it closed. Now, I said I was going to do three cases. Well, let's just do one more because these are all some sort of bigger cases. And sometimes just the little stuff is really what matters to patients and what you need help with. So this was a young woman, 24 year old, who was uh, out on fresh water. Okay, that's already a problem. Hit a boulder, uh, went to an ER, uh, urgent care, uh, had a big laceration, and they just closed it up. And within 24 hours, she was in our emergency room with a completely pussed out wound. Uh, in, in, in having had this in injury incurred in setting a fresh water is a real concern that she could have a significant 
uh, necrotizing potential infection. So it was suppurative mostly and deep all the way down to the tibia, brought it to the operating room, debrided it. This really needed some debridement because there was so much non-viable tissue that had been trapped from the original injury. And then put on this very small installation foam uh, with contact down into the layers of the fascia and then foam tracking out here. There's a little bit of extra foam right underneath the track pad so that that's not causing pressure injury to the skin because it was a smaller area. Left this all on for, um, uh, for three days with again, normal saline every three and a half hours for 10 minutes. And then was able to do a primary closure but added to the primary closure that incisional negative pressure therapy with the Provena. Then she went home and came back to clinic and got it. This is what it looks like getting removed in clinic here. You can see the incision is gorgeous. This is tight, taut skin over the tibia that at the time she came to us was very, very infective, suppurative, was able to get it closed, keep it from dehissing. She healed very well, primarily. I did add a drain just because of the depth of the, uh, the wound, but she did not develop a seroma. So this is putting it all together, using the fluid, using the foam uh, to really get a wound that is as healthy as possible. And then using that incisional therapy to resuscitate the incision so it doesn't dehiss and so it doesn't get an infection or seroma. Really, really appreciated the chance to share these cases with you um, and really appreciate your time and attention.